Greetings, everyone. I know some of you are still enjoying your lunch, and I want to invite you to continue to do that. Uh, my name is Jonathan Zier, and I'm the president and CEO for Greater Mankato Growth. And uh, we are thrilled to have all of you here today with us. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to be here. And uh, we're also just really proud as a community that uh, we're able to attract the caliber of speaker that we have today uh, in, in President uh, Kocher Lakota. And you'll hear more about him in a minute, and you'll hear from him soon. Um, all of you have seen the news and paid attention to it and kept track of it. And you know that one of the things that gets discussed quite often is the Federal Reserve and rates and uh, what interest that has to us and what kind of impact it might be. So this really is a great opportunity for us today to have someone who's part of the Federal Reserve, a leader within the Federal Reserve, be here today to talk to us about the economy, both on a global scale to a local scale, because that is truly intertwined. I want to make sure that before I go too far, I make sure that I thank some of our sponsors today. Consolidated Communications has been our uh, sponsor for our Public Affairs, Affairs uh, Forum series this year. So I'd like to thank them. And I also want to thank Minnesota State University Mankato and President Richard Davenport for hosting the, this event today. If you would, please help me thank both of them. Uh, speaking of the opportunity to bring high-level, high-caliber individuals to our community, if you've not yet taken an opportunity to uh, uh, be a part of the inaugural Journeys of Leadership event, uh, which is what helps make events like this possible, uh, we'll be featuring a BP executive and Mankato native, John Jimenez, on October 20th. There are still some tickets available to the, that event, and you can register online at greatermankato.com to get those. Let me take a minute now and... Uh, help you get to know uh, President Nariana Kocher Lakota. He took office as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis on October 8, 2009. In his capacity there, President Kocher Lakota serves on the Federal Open Market Committee. Later you may hear me refer to that as the FOMC. It's the policy-making arm of the Federal Reserve System. In addition to his responsibilities as a, as a monetary policymaker, President Kocher Lakota oversees all operations of the bank, including supervision and regulation and payments and services. Before his appointment as president, President Kocher Lakota served as a member of the Minneapolis Fed's research staff, as well as a research consultant for the bank itself. His prior experience includes professorships at the University of Minnesota, where he was chair of the economics department and also at Stanford University. President Kocher Lakota has published more than 30 articles in academic journals on a variety of topics, including monetary and financial economics. President Kocher Lakota was named one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine in 2012. He earned a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago in 1987 and his AB in mathematics from Princeton in 1983. Now today's event, what's going to happen first is President Kocher Lakota will come to the stage and he's got some remarks that he's going to prepare, that he's prepared for you. And I'm told that today there will actually be an extended version. So he's got a more brief road show that he often gives, but today you're going to be treated to something even more in depth and a little bit more grand than uh, most audiences. In a part, it might be this is his last, at the moment, his last publicly scheduled speaking experience before he retires from the Federal Reserve at the end of the year. So we are quite fortunate to have him here today. Uh, when he's done with that, in 20, 30 minutes, whatever he's comfortable with, whatever it takes him, then I'll rejoin him at the stage. We'll take the chairs here, and we'll have some time for some Q&A. So there might be questions you'll want to ask. We'll invite you to do that. Uh, I've got some prepared questions as well, but he'll certainly be interested in questions that you have. That'll be the flow for the day. Um, and with that, please help me give a warm, greater Mankato welcome to President Nariana Coach Lacombe. Thanks, Dr. Coach. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. It's a great introduction. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank uh, you for, the, for coming out today, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, so my speech today is going to focus on the behavior of the labor market over the past nine years. So we're in 2015 now. I'm going to be taking this back to 2006. I'm going to document for you that 
After several painful years of labor market stagnation, the United States experienced truly historic improvement in labor market performance in 2014. So that was last year. Unfortunately, these labor market gains have slowed markedly in the current year, 2015. Now this may suggest that, uh, to some, that there's a uh, little room for further improvement in labor market outcomes. I'm gonna argue that's not true. I'm gonna argue that current and projected low inflation presents strong evidence to the contrary. There is room for more improvement in labor markets. But we only achieve those gains if we're going to make the right monetary policy choices. And I'll, I'll talk about what I believe those choices to be. Now, as, as Jonathan mentioned, I really look forward to taking your uh, prepare, uh, questions at the end of my prepared remarks. Uh, for me, those questions are the highlight of my speaking engagements. Uh, as I'll discuss briefly, two-way communication between policymakers and citizens is really a core function of the Federal Reserve System. And your questions are a key part of that uh, two-way communication. One thing I need to emphasize uh, right at the start, and it's uh, really important for you to keep in mind, is that I'm speaking only for myself today. I'm not speaking, and I, the views I express today are my own. And they're not necessarily those of any others in the Federal Reserve System, including my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. So I'm going to start with some basics about the Federal Reserve System. And I like to tell people that the, the Fed, as we, we uh, call it colloquially, is a uniquely American institution. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, relative to its counterparts around the world, the US Central Bank is highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that along with the Board of Governors in Washington, DC, makes up the Federal Reserve System. So our bank, located um, uh, in Minneapolis, serves as a headquarters for Federal Reserve operations in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve districts. So our ninth district includes the state of Montana, uh, the, uh, the states of North and South Dakota, Minnesota, of course, parts of Wisconsin, and parts of, of Michigan. Now, eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, as I'm going to refer to it going forward, needs to set the path of monetary stimulus over the next six to seven weeks. Now, all 12 presidents of the various regional uh, reserve banks, including me, and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board contribute to these deliberations uh, in Washington. But at any given moment in time, not all the presidents vote on monetary policy. So the voting members of the committee at any given point in time uh, consist of the governors. They always get to vote. The president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, who always gets a vote, and then a rotating group of four other presidents. Now, in this way, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the structure of our government, because representatives from different regions in the country, the various presidents, have input into FOMC deliberations. Uh, just to save a question later, this year I'm not voting. Last year I did vote, this, uh, but this year I rotated off the voting mem membership of the committee. I'm not voting. Okay, so I described a system which is, is high, highly decentralized, especially if you were to look at other central banks, you just don't see this kind of system. But I think this system, which is, despite its unusualness, has many desirable attributes. I think the most important is that it facilitates two-way communication between the nation's central bank and the nation's citizens. Now, right now we're engaging one direction of that communication, as I tell you about key considerations regarding monetary policy. Now, in the other direction, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis gathers valuable economic in, uh, information from local contexts in a variety of ways. Now, what, here, here's one example of how this works. Uh, last, uh, about a couple weeks ago, I met with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis's Great Lakes Advisory Council. And this includes business and community leaders from around the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, uh, excluding the Twin Cities. We have a separate Twin Cities Advisory Council, which could, will include the same kind of broad cross-section membership, but only from the Twin Cities metropolitan area. But uh, these folks come from, uh, as I say, the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. That, that they provide their views on their local economies and their businesses, and that's helpful to us in formulating a picture of how the economy is going to be unfolding. 
We meet, also meet with business and community leaders from many other economic sectors through our other advisory councils and outreach programs. The public service of these people and their many contacts helps ensure that we have a deeper understanding of what is happening in the local economy beyond what we would just get by looking at national economic statistics. So I think this uh, two-way communication is really desirable. But let me turn back now to how, uh, uh, the, the FOMC and the making of monetary policy. So I mentioned that the FOMC meets eight times per year. At these meetings, we decide on an appropriate stance on monetary policy for the, for, the, for the national economy. But what are we trying to achieve by varying monetary policy? So Congress created the Federal Reserve and, and, and uh, has charged the Federal Open Market Committee with making monetary policy to achieve two goals, to promote maximum employment and to promote price stability. That second goal of price stability has been interpreted uh, to mean keeping inflation close to 2% per year. Okay, so I think those, those goals are gonna be very important for you to keep in mind because that's how, when I think about what's appropriate in terms of monetary policy, I'm always going back to those goals to think about, okay, how, do, how, do, how can we do better on those dimensions? Okay, so now I'm gonna to turn to the FOMC's performance with respect to its employment mandate over the past nine years, um, since December of 2006 to be more specific. Now many metrics are used to measure labor market performance. And at any given point in time, you'll hear a number of different metrics thrown around. I'm gonna concentrate on one today. And it's the, what I see is a, a very basic metric. It's a fraction of prime age people, those uh, people who are age 25 to 54, who have a job. Now, a lot of different ways to slice this, but uh, this is one particular way. Now, why do I focus on, on uh, uh, those individuals who are age 25 to 54? It's a simple way to strip out the demographic effect of the retirement of the baby boom cohort. So we have a large cohort of people who are entering retirement age. That's gonna, of course, just for natural reasons, decrease the number of uh, people who have a job, we can strip out that effect by looking at those individuals who are not in a natural retirement age. So looking at those who are people who are 25 to 54 in age. Okay, so let's let's see what that looks like. This is my uh, uh, first chart I'll show you. And this is the fraction of people age 25 to 54 at any given time who have a job. Now we go back to um, the uh, beginning of my uh, time frame that I'm looking at, which is early, uh, late 2006, early 2007, and you'll see that over 80% of those individuals age 25 to 54 had a job in uh, late 2006. From that point forward, through December 2009, labor market performance deteriorated rapidly. So the fraction of prime age people who had a job fell from about 80% to 75%. This is in a three year time frame. Now these people did not suddenly become disabled, nor did they suddenly decide they would have more fun staying home and playing video games and working. Rather, it was a large group of people with talents and skills who would have been employed in 2006, but were not being utilized by the US economy three years later. So in this sense, this five percentage point uh, uh, decline in the employment to population ratio actually represents a dramatic and disturbing waste of America's valuable human resources. Okay, so that takes us through uh, 2009. So what happens then, so from December 2009 through about the end of 2013, you see some recovery in this number. So uh, I don't have my little great bars up here today, but the Great Recession, is usually dated as having started at the end of 2007 and lasted through the middle of 2009. So by the end of 2009, we're in recovery mode in the country. But boy, that recovery is hard to see, right? For um, we started at the end of 2009, we moved to the end of 2013. You see some recovery, but boy, it's 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 sluggish. Um, so by the end of 2013, this fraction had risen back to 76%. It had got fallen as low as 75, and we're back up to 76. Remember, we were at 80 before the beginning of the Great Recession. 
Now, by the end of 2013, many observers were concerned that the U.S. was stuck in some kind of new normal in terms of employment. But then 2014 happened. And the fraction of uh, people with a job rose dramatically in 2014 by 0.9 percentage points. That, it's hard to know what that number means, right? It's just, you know, it's just a number uh, uh, that an economist throws at you. But that was the largest December to December increase in, one, uh, in, uh, in over of a quarter century. So you can go back 25 years, you will not find a better, better increase in that number than we had in 2014. I, I just, you look at that kind of increase and it, you, the, the, the pessimism of thinking 2013 was a new normal was just unwarranted. Unfortunately, this progress has slowed sharply in 2015. So the fraction of prime age people with a job has risen only 0.2 percentage points since December of last year, 2014, and it's basically unchanged since January of this year. So we're at 77.2%. At We've been at that 77.2% since January. And as a result, we're not making progress. That is, we remain three, almost three percentage points below uh, the pre-recession levels in terms of the fraction of prime age individuals who have a job in the United States. Okay, so what does this mean for monetary policy? So as I mentioned earlier, Congress has charged the FOMC with making monetary policy so as to promote maximum employment and to promote price stability. And we saw rapidly market improvement in 2014, but that rate of improvement is slow, noticeably in 2015. Does that mean we're close to the top of the hill? Does that mean that we're close to achieving that goal that Congress has set for us of, of maximum employment? In my view, you have to look at another source of information to, to know the answer to that. And in my view, the behavior inflation clearly shows that the answer to this question is no. We, the FOMC can facilitate further improvement in the labor market performance, and we've seen this chart. As I noted earlier, um, the price stability mandate has been translated to mean a personal consumption expenditure inflation rate, PCE inflation rate, of 2%. So what's happening with inflation? Okay, so this is inflation since uh, the start of the Great Recession. So I don't go all the way back to 2006. I'm only going back to uh, the end of 2007 for this chart. And so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of information in this chart. So the blue line is just what's happening with inflation itself. Boy, it, it, in, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to point out that, boy, it got very high right in 2008. And that's because this is what so, so, sometimes called headline inflation. So it's including both food and energy goods and services. It tends to wiggle around a lot because of the price of oil translated into the price of gasoline. And then we end up with a lot, of, a, a lot of movement. It's very hard to use where this number is at a given point in time to forecast where inflation is going to go in the future. And it's because oil price changes, uh, oil price inflation is transitory typically. It, it doesn't. Just because oil's gone, um, gone up by, uh, up to uh, very rapidly as it did in the beginning of 2008, it doesn't mean it's going to keep going up. And in fact, turn around and collapse, which is why uh, by the beginning of 2009, uh, inflation, uh, headline inflation has fallen to minus 1%. But there's other, uh, there's, other inf there's other information in this chart. Since December 2007, the average inflation rate has been 1.4%. So remember, our target is 2 uh, and you can see the target, and the helpful green line there is showing you the target is 2%. The, uh, uh, where are we right now? Well, headline inflation is really low, 0.3%, well below our target of, 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 of 2. And this is, this is not a transitory matter. Um, inflation's been below the FOMC's target of 2% um, for uh, well over three years at this point. So you can look at the chart, you can see the target is pretty much always above the blue line for the last three years. That's, that's indicative that we're not hitting our, hitting our target. Now, I just suggested to you that you have to be careful about looking at headline inflation as a, as a guide to work, uh, how we're doing on inflation. The reason for that is we're really interested, when we make monetary policy, it operates in the economy of lag. And so you're really interested in where inflation is going to go as opposed to where it is um, right now. 
And I, I would certainly agree, many people have pointed this out, but I'll, I'll, I'll add to this. The current low rate inflation, in fact, we're almost at, uh, close to zero, that's attributable in part to temporary downward pressures from falling oil prices that translate into gasoline prices. But let's strip those out. Let's take out uh, food and energy prices, which tend to be volatile and, and pretty transitory in, in uh, nature. And look at what's called core inflation. So that's the red line now. And you'll see it's much smoother than the blue line. But if you use your imagination, it's essentially a smoothed out version of the blue line. And we're basically taking out the wiggles that are being driven by food and energy, and you're getting something that's more close to what's really underlying rate of inflation in the economy. So what's happened with that? Well, actually, it's telling a very similar story to what you saw in headline. Um, the average of, of core since the end of the uh, since the beginning of the recession, it's been one and a half percent, well below our target of two. And right now, uh, we're not. <laughs> it's not like inflation's picking up. It's at 1.3 percent. So it, even further below two than the, the, uh, um, the, the, the average for, since the end, end of 2007. One thing it's, I think, important to point out here about core is, with the exception of a few months that if you use your, if you're really better eyesight than I, I have, at the end of 2011, 2012, it ticked a little bit above two. Except for that, those few months then, um, core inflation has been below 2%. Uh, going back seven years. So this is, again, not a temporary phenomenon. Low inflation has been with us for a long time. But where are we going in the future with inflation? I think core is helpful in understanding that. It tends to be pretty persistent at 1.3. That tells you a lot right there. But a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to forecast inflation. Um, public sector forecasters, private sector forecasters. and. Both of these groups are forecasting that inflation is going to remain below the FOMC's target um, over the next 18 to 24 months. Now, why do I mention 18 to 24 months? That's usually the lag with which we expect monetary policy to operate. So we expect, if we make a choice today, it's going to impact the economy 18 to 24 months down the road. So we want to know, where is inflation going to go at that point? Um, if it's going to be too high, we want to, we want to do something about that. If it's going to be too low, we want to do something about that. Um, both, and as I said, uh, forecasters are, based, are predicting that inflation is going to remain below uh, 2% over the uh, 18 to 24 months, and really beyond that. Uh, in terms of the private sector, uh, the median projections in the August survey of professional forecasters is that PC inflation will be below 2% in 2015, 2016, and 2017. In terms of the public sector, in June of this year, the Federal Reserve Board's staff outlooks, or our own staff, here in the, in the Federal Reserve System, was that PC inflation would remain below 2% into the next decade, so into the 2020s. And these forecasts are largely consistent with my own. Uh, I've been saying for some time, um, based on what I perceive to be the likely evolution of uh, monetary policy, I don't expect PC inflation to return to target until 2018 or, or possibly even later. Okay, so I've talked about employment, I've talked about inflation, and Take away from inflation, inflation is low relative target and projected to remain low relative target. Now, this is often depicted as being bad news. Man, the FOMC can't get inflation back to target. It's really not bad news. It's a huge opportunity. It's a free launch for us as monetary policymakers. There would be little or no inflationary cost if the committee were to aim for the kind of remarkable improvement in labor market conditions that I showed you in 2014 by adopting a more accommodated monetary policy stance. Now, I want to be cautious here because at any given point in time, we don't really know, we're always making estimates about where, where employment is going to go in the long run. And many uh, changes in the economy influence that. But I see low inflation and the strong labor market improvement in 2014 as being important pieces of evidence against the hypothesis that the Great Recession caused permanent damage to the United States economy and to the labor market in particular. If we don't have that evidence that there has been permanent damage, I think it's only appropriate for us to aim to return the labor market, to return employment to what it was before the Great Recession, back to 2006. Now, I, in a speech earlier this year, I did some really simple uh, calculations 
that suggested we will need at least three more years, as good as 2014, to return to 2006 uh, employment rates. Okay, so low inflation projected to remain low. We don't face a cost of providing accommodation in order to generate employment gains that might bring us back to where we were in 2006. Now this a discussion does raise a key question. Why has the rate of labor market improvement slowed so much in 2015 relative to 2014? You know, there's no uh, way to give a definitive answer to these kinds of questions. Um, but in thinking about this question, I do find the timing of monetary policy t uh, changes to be highly suggestive. So in mid-2013, the FOMC announced its intention to taper its ongoing asset purchase program. Now, you don't need to know much about the, if, if you don't recall the details a lot, it's not that important. It essentially was a surprise to people who tracked the Fed very carefully, people who were trading uh, in financial markets, were surprised that the FOMC was essentially beginning to tighten monetary policy. Now, why do I say they were surprised? Well, prices changed in financial markets changed a lot. Uh, there are sharp upward movements in long-term bond yields associated with the, the announcement from the FOMC. Now, my own personal interpretation, and I just suggested this, is this policy change back in 2013 was the onset of what the committee currently intends to be a long, gradual tightening process. Now, I noted earlier that we ex typically expect such a change in monetary policy to a t uh, moving to tightening to affect the economy of lag about 18 to 24 months. So there, we're talking about mid-2013, 18 to 24 months later, well, now we, we have a story. The slow rate of labor market improvement in 2015 is not all that surprising if you take that perspective. So I believe the FOMC should be taking actions to facilitate a resumption of the 2014 improvement in the labor market by adopting a more accommodating monetary policy stance. Remember, as I mentioned earlier, and we can see it in our charts, inflation is low. There's headline. This is all you want to include oil, I mean, gasoline, this is, and, and food, here it is. It's really low right now. And even if you strip those out, it's low. It's expected to remain low for years to come. So I, I, I think there's, there's, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no cost associated with uh, uh, having a more accommodative stance. In particular, I don't see raising the target range for the Fed funds rate above its current low level in this calendar year or the next calendar year of 2016 as being consistent with the pursuit of the kind of labor market outcomes that the FOMC is in fact charged with delivering. I would be open to the possibility of reducing the Fed funds target range even further than it currently is as a way of producing better labor market outcomes. There's a now. This is one person's perspective on inflation. Well, not just one person. <laughs> a lot of forecasters are saying the same thing about inflation. There's a risk that inflationary pressures could build up more rapidly than I've, I've described or uh, and that is currently being forecasted. But the solution to that scenario is simple. Raise interest rates. Given my current outlook, I believe that it would be appropriate to wait until 2017 to initiate liftoff and then red, raise the Fed funds rate at about two percentage points per year. My preferred pace of tightening mirrors the pace of tightening from 2004 to 2006. Now that pace of tightening is generally referred to as being gradual. In fact, there are some that would argue that with the benefit of hindsight, it was too gradual. You don't want to hear too many people say that was too fast. In response to unanticipated inflationary pressures, if inflation emerges more rapidly than I, I or others currently anticipate, the committee could react as it did in 1994 and raise the Fed funds rate more rapidly than uh, the, this gradual pace. And there wasn't a, you know, it didn't, didn't cause a, a, a recession in the economy by raising rates more rapidly in, in, in 1994. Okay, so let me wrap up and we'll, we'll, we'll turn to questions. So I'm an economist, um, been one for a long time. And economics is often, with very good reason, called the dismal science. But that's not my message today. My message today is one of hope and optimism.
From 2006 to 2009, we saw a marked deterioration in labor market performance. And as recently as January 2014, it seemed like this loss of, of, of human resources might prove to be permanent for the United States economy. But the rapid growth we saw in employment in 2014 shattered this hypothesis. The lesson of 2014 is clear. We can do better. Given 2014, and given how low inflation is expected to be over the next few years, I see no reason why the committee should not aim to facilitate continued improvement in labor market outcomes. Indeed, I currently see no reason why we should not be aiming for the kind of strong labor market conditions that prevailed at the end of 2006. Yes, we might not get there, but as low as, as long as inflation is as low as it would be expected to be, there's no cost in trying. But all, we're only going to have a chance of getting there if we make the right choices. We can only achieve, the committee, the FOMC, can only achieve its congressionally mandated price and employment goals by being extraordinarily patient in removing the, 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 reducing the level of monetary accommodation. Indeed, in my view, to best fulfill its congressional mandates, the committee should be considering reducing the target range for the Fed funds rate, not increasing it. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions. So I believe we have, or will have, a couple of microphones that will be available. And if you have a question, then uh, we'll invite you to step up to one of those microphones and uh, we'll call on you at that point. But let me, um, let me get started first by, uh, and thank you very much. Very oh, it's remarks. my pleasure, thanks. Appreciate the graphics. Um, and there's a lot of people in the room that uh, spend their days looking at this type of information. There's a, probably a heavy concentration of financial people in the room today. Certainly noticed that coming in. But one of the things I'm curious about is the international impacts to this. What, what, what brings to you the most concern about what happens on an international stage and how it impacts decision making and how you go out your thought process? Yeah, I, so the starting point is that the US economy is a very large economy. We still remain a relatively closed. And so I, I, the, my, my, my thinking about the US economy, the, the, the main impulse, especially over the time frame I'm talking about, 18 to 24 months, is, is domestic. Uh, with all that said, um, certainly uh, uh, the changes in the global economy have an influence on our uh, export and import position. They have an influence on our financial markets. And so I, I, you do take that into account as impacting the, uh, our, our economy. Um, you know, my, I would say the news we've gotten from uh, um, both from uh, hard numbers, the real GDP numbers and that kind of thing from China, and also from what we've seen from financial markets has been that there's clearly concerns about global economic risks in, in, among financial markets. And the news from China has been uh, more disappointing than I would have thought. Um, how much does that influence my outlook for a, a, a variables like employment and, and inflation? It's a downside risk, I would call it. It doesn't have huge impact on, on the, uh, just the modal or the benchmark outlook. But it does introduce risks. Those risks are uh, one more reason to be cautious about um, raising interest rates at this time. We hear a lot of conversation, too, about the, the strength of the dollar and currently some of the drag on the strong dollar. Can you talk about that and the impact? What, what causes that? How, can that? how can that be changed? How can that be influenced? Is there a role the Fed has in that? So the short answer to the last question is that the, you know, the, the value of the dollar is a decision made by the Treasury Department and, 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 and not by us uh, at the Federal Reserve. With that said, um, you know, the decisions we make do influence the value of the dollar. Um, if you tighten monetary policy, that tends to uh, uh, drive up the value of the dollar relative to other currencies. If you ease monetary policy, try to, uh, unexpectedly, it tends to drive it down. But the fundamental uh, decision makers about the value of the dollar in the, in the US government are in the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just want to make sure, in case there are any questions, I said they put the mic up front where it's very uncomfortable, probably, for most of you to walk to, right? So if you do have a question, we'll make sure the mic gets to you. Yeah, we can well. get to yeah. Yes. Yesterday, 
So uh, first question, uh, take the first question first, and maybe I'll spend the next 25 minutes on that. Huh? No. Um, so I think the, uh, um, the first question is about uh, agriculture and commodity prices. You know, it, it, predicting what, where, how commodity prices are going to evolve is, is very challenging, and uh, I won't attempt to do it. I'm sure there are many people in this room that are, would be better, better equipped to do that than, than, than I am. With that, with that said, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we, the news I hear from around the district um, is that, you know, commodity prices are definitely uh, low relative to where they've been in the last two, three years. Uh, that's putting uh, uh, some, some pressure on, our, on, on uh, folks in the agricultural sector. Uh, the good news I, that, and again, I, I hear this from uh, our local contacts, is that uh, you know, the, the estimates of yields in this part of, of the district are very high, and that's going to be an offset to that. Um, where do you expect commodity prices to go in the future? In general, my own uh, rule is the people who are trading those commodities are trying to impound all the information they have available about where they're going to go in the future. And so your, a, good, a good estimate is where they are right now is where they're going to be in the future. I, so I, I tend not to expect sudden increases or sudden declines. But, uh, lots of risks in that space. You asked about uh, Chairman Bernanke's comment about um, uh, about bank executives, you know, or for, I should say former Chairman Bernanke at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not really informed enough to have you know strong strong views on that at this point. I, I, I have bought his book. I'm sure he'll be glad to hear that I I downloaded it on Kindle at uh, 4 a.m. on October 5th, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet, so I wouldn't be I don't have uh, the same information he has. Other questions? Michael. This is the uh, presidential election year next year. Uh, what do you think the next president could do uh, to get us great things? Great question. Um, and uh, you know, as, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, I'll be uh, leaving my current job in uh, <laughs> and that, uh, at the end of the year, and that 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 that. One of the things that's true about having this position is that it comes with a heavy mantle of, of being restrained in my judgments about political matters. Um, we're a politically neutral organization. It means we don't offer opinions about, uh, about, about uh, the various political parties or candidates. We don't offer really much in the way of perspectives on, on even policy choices that are on consideration by, say, uh, fiscal policy by, by, uh, by the Congress and the President. I'll, I'll say something which is, I, uh, with that said, I'm going to say something pretty vanilla and pretty obvious, I think, which is, boy, it'd be great if uh, we were able to get to a point of having a little more certainty about the choices that were being made in Washington. Um, you know, if we got to a point where the uh, President and the Congress were able to operate effectively to, to offer us uh, um, uh, more certainty about, about choices being made. And the most fundamental of those, I think, is that there is a currently remains a tension between our commitments that we've made as a society to our older citizens and the projected path of taxes. So if you look at the Congressional Budget Office's uh, forecast for the evolution of the, of the deficit, you know, things look good right now in terms of they've come down quite a bit on the deficit, um, but it's going to start to ramp up towards the end of this decade. And that's because we, we just demographically, we've got a lot of people who are reaching an age where they're getting older, uh, they're going to get Medicare, and, uh, and, and then the question, we don't have the tax, tax system in place right now to support that. So there has to be a choice made. Are we going to keep those benefits the same, those, those uh, payments the same, or are we, are we going to, are going to raise tax? Uh, and that would require raising taxes, or are we going to uh, cut back on those benefits? I don't offer a perspective on <laughs> What that, which way we should go on that. But uh, arithmetic tells me you have to make a choice one way or the other. And I think, ha I think the economy would benefit by having more certainty about how we're going to make that choice. And in January, you might have even more to offer, right? <laughs> you know, in January, I would, would be able to say more about that issue, but I would uh, not, not as many people would be interested in what I have to say. So that's a trade-off. <laughs> now, one of the things that, that uh, I had an opportunity to do prior to this was uh, Patrick shared with me some recent articles um, about the Fed Reserve and the conversations. And this FOMC, um, talk a little bit about what that's like, because it clearly based, even on your remarks here and some of those articles, everybody in the room isn't agreeing when you come to the table, right? And so there's, there must be deliberation, how do decisions get made? That's something 
We only see a speech about afterwards. We don't see what really goes on. There must be something intriguing. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a, first of all a great group to be a part of, and it's uh, and, it, and it's because of the, this issue I just mentioned, the, the the political neutrality of it. It's really a very technical conversation that takes place about uh, where do you think inflation is going to go? Where do you think employment is going to go? What choices should we be making to, to achieve better in terms of our objectives? Um, as you pointed out, you know, there's 17 participants in these meetings. So uh, uh, we're, we're, the, we don't have as many governors as we should at this point. We only have five. So we're down to 17 participants. And that, but each person speaks in turn about where they see the economy going. And then, um, and then, uh, I should back up for a second. First, staff pre make presentations to us about their about their uh, projections for the economy, where 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 things have gone, where where they see things going, both internationally and nationally, and and in the financial markets. Then we each speak in turn about um, about what's going on, our perspectives in the economy, and I'll offer perspectives based on Ninth District Intelligence, for example, as well. Um, then uh, we'll each speak in turn about the policy choices that are available to the committee and how we see those. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, lucky woman, Sherry Yellen gets to pull that all together into a, to build a consensus. And uh, she's, you know, she's just, uh, as, as Chair, Chairman Bernanke has done before her, they both have done a great job, I think, of, of, of driving consensus. I, I should be clear, as I, 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 I right now, I, I think it would be safe to say that my own perspectives I've shared with you about the course of monetary policy are not at the center of the committee. Um, and one way to document that numerically would be to say that um, at the last uh, meeting, when we, submit, we released a summary of economic projections, which we were, were committee, uh, where participants saw the course of interest rates in particular, and 13 of, seven, of the 17 participants projected that there would be an interest rate increase in calendar year 2015. Um, and only one participant projected uh, that uh, we should wait till 2017. So there's, you know, there's, you could see that that divide right there. And that, but the center of the committee, as I say, is 13 of the 17 saw it being appropriate to raise rates before the end of the end of the calendar year. There's a question over here. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about the import export bank. There have been lots of headlines about that recently, and its uh, recent lack of funding to continue its operations. Can you tell us a little bit about? its total impact on A, the American economy, and then B, the global economy, and what may or may not we feel in this region if it is no longer with us? It's a great question, and unfortunately, I just don't have the uh, information available to, to, to tell you much about that. I guess, I guess that, that, um, that answer in and of itself reveals that I you know, don't see it as being uh, hugely material for the course of the kind of employment and inflation uh, number of metrics that I, I, I mentioned, which, but that does not mean that it would not be important for this, could, might, might, might not potentially be important for this district or for, for many, many uh, uh, individual firms around the country or, or overseas. That's just not something I, I have much in, in information to provide on that. Another question. Yes, as I look at your labor market statistics um, from 2013, I was curious as what uh, data overlays the Fed has done in a study on the uh, a truly new tax, the Affordable Care Act, and what, um, I know you've got to be politically neutral, um, what effect that may or may not have had on the labor market? You know, it, it, the, the estimates that we have access to is that the, uh, the impact of that has not been that large. Um, I mean, it's, it's not something that, um, I think has mattered uh, that materially. I, I think the bigger news from healthcare, from um, my point of view, is less about the ACA and more about how slowly healthcare costs have been rising over the last four or five years. Um, if you know that affects inflation first of all, uh, but secondly, it's a big deal in terms of those deficit numbers I was just describing. Uh, if if healthcare costs were to continue to grow uh, relatively slowly, that would be very good news in terms of this gap I mentioned earlier between um, uh, uh, what we've committed to our older citizens and the taxes we've, we we're, we're currently uh, committed to be uh, on, on, on uh, going to collect according to the statute. Um, but yeah, in terms of the uh, direct effect of ACA, 
Um, I, I, the estimates I've seen suggest that that's quite modest compared to the overall track of these, these numbers. This is uh, about, uh, I look at these numbers and I see lack of demand as being the, the biggest question, issue that's facing the US economy. And um, it sounds counterintuitive, but you know, because the Fed has you know, obviously kept interest rates for, for low for a very long period of time, but it's a sign that people are not, even though interest rates are as low as they are, they're not willing to spend enough, and households and firms are not willing to spend enough to exploit and take advantage of all the human resources that are remain idle in this country. Other question. So what's what's life like? Okay, go ahead. So th the question is, would raising rates um, actually stimulate um, um, more activity, more investment activity in particular by, by firms? Uh, as, you, as you mentioned yourself, this goes against conventional wisdom. And the reason it does is because uh, if you raise interest rates, that makes the market investments look more attractive. And on the margin, it makes it look like you'd be less willing to invest, say, in, in building a new building because, boy, you're getting a good rate of return in, 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 the, in, the, in financial markets instead. With that said, the, the, the question you raise is one that actually troubled me for quite some time, which is when you keep rates low like, like we're doing, um, it makes it co relatively cheap to wait to do things. So you know, you're, you're, about, you're, you're just determining whether or not you want to build a, a new apartment building, for example. There's always uncertainties, right? There's always things that need to be resolved, figure out. And there's a cost of waiting, typically, which is you're losing out on the time value of money, which is the interest rate. So you want to move now as opposed to later because you're getting, getting that interest benefit. And the benefit of waiting is you get these uncertainties resolved. So we actually did a fair amount of, of work within our bank to try to, re to see how big this effect is, this value of waiting given how low interest rates are just could not get it to be that big compared to all the other channels that low interest rates work through to, to generate, generate uh, more, more stimulus. Um, you know, I think if we look at the interest rate sensitive uh, parts of the economy, auto, autos for example would be one, one clear example, you see the responses to low interest rates driving through demand. It's, it's, um, We've just not been able to do as much as we would like, um, given given the, the constraints we face on 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 interest rates. Another question. So, uh, um, uh, great question. Um, so the question was, uh, I'll, I'll strip out some of the, some of the parts that you, you put in there, but the basic question is, what, uh, what's the other side seeing? That is, I, I advocated a position of being uh, patient about removing accommodation, in fact, potentially considering increasing accommodation. Uh, what, what are, the, what are other, other uh, observers seeing that lead them to, to be uh, more in favor of being inclined to raising rates in the, uh, the, by the end of the calendar year? So Chair Yellen gave a speech um, about 10 days ago, I think, on inflation and talked about what she, uh, uh, the risk that she saw as paramount. And I think the, the way I would summarize that, the, 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 what she talked about is the possibility that um, Inflationary pressures could emerge more rapidly than we currently anticipate. And then we would have to raise rates uh, overly abruptly. So I talked a little bit about that in my, my speech in, in, as well. Um, so right now, the FOMC is, you know, as I said, uh, 13 of the 17 projected um, raising rates by the end of the calendar year. But the, the pace of increase is very slow, um, about a percentage point a year for the next three years after the initial increase. Um, 
And Chair Yellen is worried about a risk developing where inflation pressures emerge more rapidly than the committee currently anticipates, and you have to raise rates uh, uh, more rapidly. And so this is an argument for starting now and moving slowly as opposed to waiting and maybe having to move more rapidly. And so that, I think, is that uh, I, I said, I don't speak for the center of the committee. Chair Yellen does. And so you know, that you can take as being a, a good description, I think, of uh, where the, 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 concerns, uh, the concerns of an important part of the committee uh, lie. Another question. We have just a couple of minutes left, so. I do, I'm going to be a little hesitant, but because uh, um, I'd have to go off the top of my head, so I might be a little misleading. But certainly, the, you know, if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they'll have the information on their website. But I'll, I'll try to do it off the top of my head, which is that uh, male employment to population ratio uh, fell a lot more during the recession and has come back, but also has come back better. Uh, female labor force, uh, male employment ratio female employment to population ratio fell more sharply, which fell less sharply during the recession, but has not come back as much. Uh, and part of this is related to sectors that were dominated by men um, in terms of employment, uh, manufacturing, construction, really were very hard hit during the Great Recession, but also have come back better um, uh, afterwards. Uh, you know, in terms of the uh, racial breakdown, I'm not, I'm not going to know these numbers off the top of my head. I know the unemployment numbers uh, a little better. And basically, um, you know, African-American unemployment remains much higher than, than, uh, than, than, uh, than is true for the, for, for, for the national average. Uh, if you think about a number as being about close to twice as high, that's probably about right. Final question. Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think, I, I think that the, the answer lies in um, really a very sudden change in asset valuation uh, around, uh, around the world. So the question was, what caused the Great Recession? Uh, and, you, and here I really have to emphasize, this is one person's perspective. I mean, there's going to be uh, probably hundreds and thousands of economics papers written about these, this kind of question going forward. But, my own perspective is that we had a very sudden revaluation of a number of assets around the world. Um, and uh, American residential land being really the key, a key, key one. We just had huge collapse in the value of res American residential land. Uh, that was a big source of, of wealth for both people here and, uh, and globally. And then uh, that, uh, that, that meant that, boy, they didn't, they didn't want as many goods and services as a result of that. At the same time, we've, uh, I think that central banks around the world were not able to, to, to offset that shock as much as they normally would have because we ran into lower bounds in our, our, our interest rates. So the Fed lowered its interest rates uh, to 0 to 25 basis points in December 2008 and kept it there for years, um, tried th to buy long-term assets as a way to also stimulate the economy, but that was pretty imperfect. So I think part of the story was big shock. Part of the story, though, is that also central banks had a hard time offsetting that shock because of of, of constraints on their on their uh, on on their toolkits. And this is true. I've told the story from the U.S. perspective, but it actually happened uh, more broadly. I've left out the financial crisis piece of it, and I think that the financial crisis. Uh, which was uh, essentially a lot of leverage built up in the, the, in the financial system, leveraging off these, these assets that I mentioned. Um, that's clearly a piece of it as well that probably meant that made the shock bigger than it would be otherwise. Um, but uh, again, if monetary policy had, had more tools available, it could have offset those, that shock. And uh, so I, I think it's really big shock, hard offset because of constraints on, on, on the toolkit. Let's give President Coachella Coda a round of okay. applause. <laughs> See right here. But I'm gonna, I want to ask President, President Davenport to join us on the stage as well. Again, as we said in the beginning, we are just truly thankful that uh, 
President Coach Lakota took the time today to come to Greater Mankato, share with us his insight, his expertise. And uh, so we have some gifts, some small tokens uh, that we'd like to share with you today. First, uh, from Greater Mankato Growth, uh, our community is very familiar with the limestone that we quarry oh, here in our great. community. Yeah. And of course, you see it on the sides of things like the Minnesota Twin Stadium. Um, and this is something, this is a gift from uh, Vetter Stone here in Greater Mankato. And so just the state of Minnesota with our logo on it, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much, today. Jonathan. Yeah. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank yeah. you. There's some, uh, some heft weight. to this. It's got some weight to this. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to wait on this one. Okay. Thank you. I'll put this up here so I don't drop it. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming and coming back up to the University on the Hill. Uh, and I see we have a lot of students in the audience, and that makes me very happy. Uh, Jonathan, thank you, and GMG for making this uh, happen. But I want to comment on a couple things. So you all heard uh, President Coach Lakota mention he's retiring, right? Now, do you know that he was an academic before he joined this uh, outfit? So here's my thinking. When you retire, you'll become an academic, and you'll be one of us. And then you'll write a book, and then you'll become world famous. <laughs> And then we'll have you back to speak on that behalf. So anyway, given the fact that that's usually the trend, people that write books need coffee. And here's a coffee cup. <laughs> Thank you very you much. You where I was going with that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. For Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, thank you, President Culture Lakota, and uh, we thank you for your service in this role, and I uh, wish you the best uh, at, after the end of the year. So thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Thanks, thank you to all of you. Thank today. you very much for coming. Thanks for the questions. Have a great day.